Hello everyone and welcome to Cosm Art Church. Today we will be exploring art and shamanism with Alex and Allison. Thank you, Tyler. Yeah. Now, Alex and Allison, how would you define shamanism? Well, shamanism is probably the most ancient religion um, and really the sex of the shaman we really don't know. It doesn't mean that they're a man you know, you say shaman. And so, uh, but really it was the wise person who journeyed to the spirit world, basically to commune with the, uh, they might have been spirits of the departed, they might be power animals, you know, group souls of animals, they, they might be special kind of beings uh, that they have a relationship with in relation to their mountain or the things that they're around. They could have all kinds of spirit relations and they discover things. You know, the spirits might have a message for their tribe. You know, there might be something they have to, you know, somebody's coming or some kind of uh, a hard winter or some kind of thing. So they try to commune with this world of spirits that is in contact with the world of humanity and then bring that message to the tribe. It's often a healing uh, message or a healing important kind of uh, ritual that needs to take place in order for something or an offering that needs to be made in order for a certain spiritual balance to be reestablished. Mm -hmm. I was going to say that a, a shaman is a lineage uh, air. They get. They they have a lineage. They learn from a teacher who has a reputation for being a shaman. They study with that shaman. They study the rituals and the ceremonies and how to heal, and the mixtures of medicine and how to mix up the medicine and how to uh, have group sacrament. Uh, they they are able to be a leader in that way, and there's some evidence that. Uh, that shaman were artists and they were artisans obviously they made things but they also made talismans and potions and music beaded jewelry and things that were altar objects mm -hmm. and music right amulets and things like right. this ritual magical uh, uh elements that would uh either embody the spirit uh, uh somehow be imbued with it so the shaman were so connected with this world of spirits that uh, and visions you know they were receiving visionary information to share with the tribe and so uh by uh being in touch with this the way to share it uh was to create something and create a, a representation of it in order to uh have it be uh, transmitted more effectively to the crew, which is basically the same, the birthplace of visionary art. Mm -hmm. The making uh, of, of, of precious altar objects, you know, they, sometimes they have special colors, special materials that they, but they create them and then they work with those materials. Mm -hmm. Well, they're, they're like symbols of the special beings that they may have encountered in the altered state, you know, uh, which can also occur through just drumming or can occur through the uh, some kind of uh, psychedelic mm -hmm. uh, we now know. So, so these were the people who worked with the forces, with the powers, the spiritual powers, and they were, they were probably the first priests and wise people uh, uh, that were consulted. They also uh, were healed themselves. They had to heal themselves. Mm -hmm. They were a person in the group that um, actually became quite ill. Either they were mentally ill, they might have had you know, some sort of mental illness, or they were, they were exhibiting, uh, and they often lived separately. So they, they exhibited this tendency to be different or mm -hmm. to be, but they were, but they self-healed. 
And in that way, they learned how to heal. And that's how they were identified as well. Yeah, perhaps they flew a little too close to the sun, but were that's able to like nice. bring some things back. Yeah, it seems like such a um, kind of major characteristic of shamanism is the facilitation of altered states. And it's interesting to see, um, you see this especially in ayahuasca shamanism, where the shaman won't just administer medicine to the person they are healing. Sometimes just the shaman will take the medicine in order to heal whatever person they're working with. So I think that yeah. that's a really fa that's so foreign to the way we think about medicine in the West. <laughs> the doctor takes <laughs> right. the medicine. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But then like, uh, to, to take the example of that, like the Shipibo shaman mm. uh, who takes the ayahuasca and then uh, is looking at the patient and they have spoken of this kind of pattern that they see over uh, the patient's body. And maybe there's part of it, the, the pattern that doesn't, it looks a little frayed or it's a little, you know, there's something that's not so good there. Uh, yeah. It's blown out. And so their remedy is to sing a song uh, into the pattern mm. and to heal the pattern with the new sounds. Wow. And so the vibration of their voice and the spirit that rides on it is able to work on the, the luminous web that surrounds the uh, patient. Mm -hmm. and, they, and they tattoo it to their face too. Everybody mm. has a unique pattern language. So you see all these sh Shipibo uh, embroidery. They're very, very good at embroidering their pattern or patterns yeah. of other people, and they have the, they have them tattooed. Sometimes. It's interesting. It's like utilization of synesthesia in a way for healing to like kind of see sickness in a way yes. that you might not otherwise be able to see it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And uh, then sing into it. Mm -hmm. And, then and then there's a song. It. And it's your special song. Yeah. It's well, we've seen that. Do people that are still making art and then, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. you, you know, pointing artists, to all the different places like, in their art and yeah. then singing into them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Juan Carlos did uh, right. a beautiful demonstration of that, of reading the song patterns mm -hmm. in his paintings. Yeah. Now, who are some contemporary uh, archaeologists or philosophers that have brought awareness of shamanism to the West? Well... There's the uh, anthropologist, I believe, Mircea Iliad, who wrote a book called Shamanism, Technicians of Ecstasy, mm. where he first kind of more or less defined this uh, figure uh, of the earliest kind of priest and medicine person. And yeah, and Mircea Iliad, he uh, was the first sort of Westerner to study what is shamanism and to, but he never saw any shaman. He used uh, material, he collected the science of others, he collected the data of others, and he, he wrote extensively about it. But he had this sort of distance, this objectivity that he felt righteous about, that you don't like go into the culture and you don't in, you know, involve yourself with the native people, which of course became dis reputed a little bit, I mean, later on. And, uh, and other uh, anthropologists uh, studied more closely mm -hmm. with the indigenous people. Absolutely, so many. Uh, but uh, for the popularizers, uh, Michael Harner, of course, famously went and studied with uh, the shaman down in South America and was initiated into uh, uh, psychedelic use and things in a tribal way and studied for years in that tradition. Uh, then uh, using his also Western uh, scholarly knowledge and everything of the field, he tried to distill some of the uh, important features of shamanism that you can find kind of archetypally throughout uh, world culture. And so uh, that was fascinating and it was all, you know, the shaman journeys, they use the transinduction device, and uh, they're journeying usually for a healing purpose for someone in the community. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, but um, Michael Harner was was uh, you know uh, he started you know 
a, a movement in, in the West to kind of bring shamanism or the, or the benefits of shamanism and some of the principles of shamanism into a uh, more, you know, Western, I don't know, audience. Absolutely. And, and he created these incredible drumming um, tapes that you could use in your induction. Like if you wanted to go deep, you could listen to this, this uh, trance drumming. Mm -hmm. And uh, we used his uh, material in our class. And uh, in, in kind of visiting the underworlds and the upper worlds, because that's what you would do. And the underworlds would be include, including all animal life that is in the earth, you know, mm -hmm. that buries themselves. There's snakes and lots of creatures. But we always, you know, encouraged everybody who would try this to make sure that they bring with them that they're, they're encased in their protective bubble. <laughs> But we would do this, this progressive drumming and people would have visions. Mm -hmm. It was a way for people to induce their own visions for visionary artists. Yeah. Mm. So the drumming, which is uh, great for trance journeying without any substance at all, uh, is it's a way to interrupt your normal rational flow of thoughts, you know, that keep you in your mind. This way, it kind of like knocks that up and you can just access a world of visions and intuitions and things like this and encounter your animal powers. The but shaman. Then there's Jeremy Narby. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Don't forget Jeremy Narby. Who Jeremy also Narby. I, I love He's an amazing. Uh, he also went journeying and went on his uh, ayahuasca journeys. He was seeing uh, how the the all the snakes and things that people sometimes see was so reminiscent also of the dna double helixes and things so he wrote about the cosmic serpent early mm -hmm. on and his kind of anthropological and personal investigations uh, down in south america but then he also wrote a book that analyzed like 500 years of the white people looking at shamanism you know shamanism hasn't changed but the lens on the phenomena mm -hmm. has changed. And till now, we're finally, I believe, uh, sensitive enough to begin to understand uh, because people have started to take these vision-inducing sacraments and things like that themselves and understand that this is an infinite kind of world that the, these uh, shaman these special uh, people were working with and so this is a, a something that is so sacred and so uh, demanding of discipline and and uh, craft that there are um, it's often thought of shamanism as a calling more than something you'd want to do mm -hmm. it's something that you know oh so and so has fallen ill or they you know that Sometimes in the you know like late teenagehood and, and early twenties, some people like uh, experience a kind of schizophrenia. Maybe they're entering into this relationship with this spirit world. If they have good guides, if they have good support systems, they may be able to get through this trial. And uh, it's oftentimes, the things that that the shaman goes through themselves uh, in their illness, they're able to cure. Mm -hmm. And so uh, uh, that's why they, they uh, go through so much, you know, uh, they talk about dismemberment phases, you mm -hmm. know, in their visions, they might be completely taken apart and then rebuilt and with special crystal inserts, you know, in their body and things like this. So uh, bones are replaced with special magical instruments and things like this. So, so they become a new person, you know rebuilt by their visionary allies mm. and so they are a new person and you feel these visionary allies when you come into relationship with a shaman you know that's one of the ways that you can tell it's a shaman you start to feel funny when you're, you come close to them they, you're you know because they're they have these allies mm. yeah now another pivotal moment i think in terms of shamanism coming to the west is maria sabina giving right. Gordon Wasson the first, like, you know, yeah. psychedelic mushrooms. That's right. Uh, that, that legacy um, kind of, it, uh, it's from Gordon Wasson that uh, psilocybin was then eventually isolated by uh, Albert Hoffman. I know. Right? Well, yes. 
And, you know, Maria Sabina suffered in her community for it. It's interesting that, you know, that allowing that um, out of her community. But it was, I think it was meant to be that the West needed this medicine so much. And I think she realized that too, Maria Sabina. If you read her writings, which are amazing, she felt that the West needed the medicine. Yeah, and that medicine is still doing its work. It is. <laughs> Um, now, someone else uh, who I think is an important figure is Terrence McKenna, you know, someone who we uh, know and love. Uh, what, uh, what did Terrence McKenna have to say on the history of shamanism, particularly with how it relates to art? Mm. He had an art history major, didn't he? He did. Terrence, he Terrence did. I, I actually actually majored in art, graduated with a degree in art history. He always had a, a tremendous. I I think that looking at Tibetan art and things like that was part of uh, what called him into it because he recognized it from the psychedelic dimensions and things. Mm -hmm. You know, people often are looking for what's the most similar kinds of things that resemble my experiences. You know, so. He, I think, uh, and Cat McKenna, uh, Harrison, Cat Harrison, and uh, Dennis McKenna, they're the, I think, the, a pivotal uh, tr triad there in the history of psychedelics because they published a kind of, an, a, under pseudonyms, uh, this psilocybin cultivation guide mm -hmm. that had drawings uh, by Cat McKenna that were based on the Tassili uh, cave paintings. And uh, uh, Tassili is this uh, group of caves in uh, Algeria, in Africa. So the earliest example of a pretty clearly psychedelic mushroom religion or cult is in this cave. And they found it and uh, they made little drawings of these, uh, the mushroom headed beings that are scampering across the, the cave walls, carrying mushrooms, which seem to be trailing spores after them. And uh, they seem to be like these little tykes that, that uh, Terrence would always talk about. And then there was this bee shaman, and same cave, but uh, this bee shaman, it kind of looks like a bee-like face, and then all around the perimeter of it are sprouting these tiny little mushrooms. And so all around it, and it's holding mushrooms in its hands as well. And so you, want, you look at this body, it's like a web. It could be a mycelial web. It could be a hive. You know, and so honey is one of the best preservatives of mushrooms. So it's probable mm. that the uh, the bee shaman could have been a being that was encountered in these altered states and brought into uh, form because it was repeated this uh, bee shaman several times, and you have one with more uh, mushrooms and one with less uh, mushrooms and things. So. Uh, that's more or less the smoking gun, I think, for the connection between shamanism and visionary art mm -hmm. and psychedelics right there in, uh, you know, and, and Terrence and Dennis and Kat found it. Yeah, well, it's this depiction of the therian morphs, the beings that are half animal, half human, that represent this like kind of ritualistic connection between man and nature. Um, but not just the therian morphs, the form constants, the mm. abstract imagery found in these cave walls uh, where you get basic patterns like lattices and grids, honeycombs, spirals, dots, zigzags. These are forms that are constant in hallucination. Right. You know, one way that anthropologists try to explain cave art or perhaps explain it away is by saying that these early artists were simply taking things they saw in their environment and mirroring them onto the walls. And you see that with 
when you see animals like rhinos or horses painted on the walls. But when you see these geometric patterns or these therian morphs, these are not things that these people were seeing in their environment. These were things people were seeing in their interior environment. Now, it's also interesting to note that, uh, you know, inside of these caves where a lot of this art was found, just being inside of a cave is a visionary experience in itself. It is, of course, sensory deprivation. Um, and as well in these caves, some of the art is tucked away, like in, in the back of tunnels that you have to crawl on your stomach to get to. What do you think the purpose of that art tucked away would be? Well, I think that uh, if we're talking about you know, tens of thousands of years ago, and and the earliest kind of art, that the welding of shamanism and art, are, are art and religion, because you could say that this is an initiatory or a religious practice. If you crawl and, and go a certain distance, it's a secret thing that you have to be guided there by others, you know, and then you, and then you come into the cavern and then, and then it's revealed, this special work of art. You know, mm -hmm. uh, that surprise is something that would burn into somebody's consciousness and they would be part then of that clan, you know. And so, Visionary art has a quality of gathering a tribe and of uniting a tribe. And we found that true here at Cosmos. Well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, what are some other examples of indigenous people, uh, shamanic peoples, uh, creating art inspired by their journeying? Well, you have the Shipibo uh, people who uh, have patterns. Each person is designated an individual and independent pattern. And you see a lot of the Shipibo patterns in the beautiful textiles that they make and in the tattoos that they put on themselves so that they uh, are wearing their particular patterning. And in central Mexico, the Huicholi are still thriving, actually, and creating. And uh, it, it's a uh, an old tradition of uh, peyote uh, sacrament. And they create beautiful embroidery and costume. And they costume the men quite a bit, even more than the women and children. But they all wear these gorgeously embroidered uh, linen clothing. And um, they also engage in the, the bead creations, you know, that you see the, the, uh, the beadwork mm -hmm. where they take a sculpture, they sculpt the wood and then they put beeswax on it and they press the beads, the little tiny colored beads into the beeswax and that's how it, it remains there, that's how it sticks there. And they do the same thing with the yarn painting. They, they make the yarn painting of depicting their journeys and depicting mm -hmm. peyote. Peyote is very, figured very prominently in the yarn painting and in the, uh, the bead sculptures. So mm -hmm. you see a lot of them now, it's very, very beautiful work. And if you, if you own them, you support a living culture that, that is inspired by peyote, mm -hmm. that is still existent in central Mexico. Yeah, those pieces are so vibrant and so beautiful. Yes. Yeah. Wow. Now, what are some examples of contemporary uh, shamanic artists? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, the combining of the actual shamanic and uh, visionary art kind of forces we find in the remarkable uh, life's work of Pablo Amaringo, you know, and uh, from Peru. And, uh, and we happened to uh, meet up with uh, Luis Eduardo Luna and, uh, early many years ago and and uh, got to talk and and uh, meet Pablo later and things like that but you had a conversation didn't you yeah with we I recently had an interview with uh, Luis Eduardo Luna where we really explored um, kind of the background of Pablo Amaringo and how he came from a shamanic tradition uh, but kind of but but fell out of that tradition a little bit he kind of became disillusioned 
uh, after some kind of events that happened to him. Uh, but later in his life, Luis Eduardo asked him if he remembered what happened to him during those early ayahuasca experiences and if he could recall them. And he said he could. And then you have uh, he, the first few attempts to uh, that he tried to depict his ayahuasca visions. Um, and, you know, we have a clip from that interview where Luis Eduardo talks a little bit about the structure of Pablo's paintings. Let's, let's play that right now. But when you see a, 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 one of the uh, paintings by Pablo, you see many different elements. Uh, but it is like um, in, in, a, in a session or in a, you know, in a session, he will see different things but not at the same time. So mm. there is a narrative there, be, you know, behind. In mm -hmm. the way, because, okay, Pablo got the inspiration in a way from religious art. You see some of, uh, you know, a, a religious art, you have a triptychal and you have a, a story being told in the, in the triptychal, you have many elements which you have to read somehow chronologically. So it mm -hmm. is not that the picture of a whole, you know, it is a story. So it is the same with Pablo's paintings. You see, mm -hmm. you see many different elements, visionary elements, which are supposed to happen during the course of a session. Yes. So the painting doesn't embody just one moment during a session, no. but rather the whole session itself. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. You have many different elements. Yeah. So I thought that was a really interesting kind of uh, bit of information on how Pablo uh, kind of constructed these images. You know, they're, they're so narrative in a way. He tried to include everything mm -hmm. in one journey, in one painting. It was mm -hmm. like, these are all the different things that happened. And in that way, I always think they look like a map mm -hmm. because they have all information shown at, all, at one time. Yeah. They, they have they have a multi-dimensionality right. and multi-perspectival uh, kind of views. You can see the heaven world at the same time that you can see the uh, the world the middle world of people having a journey. At the same time, you can see what's going on in the jungle, and so it contains worlds within worlds which is a lot like we talk about the archetypes of visionary art, you know, like yeah. the theory and morph and thing like that, and you will definitely find them there in, in Pablo's work. But uh, you see a more complex kind of uh, a mapping, like you were saying, of the, of the worlds, and he's got a more cosmogram-like map that's uh, more like religious art uh, that tries to tell you the, the, whole, the entire yeah. philosophy, you know, like, mm. this is the great wheel, the Yama is holding the samsaric uh, world here, and it's made up of six realms and things right. like that. So all religious art can, uh, that has a sophisticated philosophy will develop charts and maps, mm. you know, to show you the hierarchy or the holoarchy uh, of being, you know, that mm -hmm. they're talking about. So that's another visionary and, archetype. And mm -hmm. Pablo Amaringo started a school where the next generation um, began to translate their images from ayahuasca into, um, into painting. And some of them are quite proficient and some of them are very good friends and we're big fans of, mm -hmm. of, uh, of some of the, uh, the great I got products some, of, of Pablo Amaringo's school. Absolutely, they were great students and they yes. and each one brought a new level of uh, dimensionality uh, to the art, you know. And proficiency, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. skill and proficiency. Yeah. They bring it into like another, like 21st century, I think. Yeah, from the uh, Usco Ayer, Ayer school, yeah. Uh, yeah. you get also Anderson Di Bernardi, That's right. who, yeah. who, whose piece kind of brings it into such high resolution um, and I think it's interesting, Luis Eduardo told me that 
he took some of Pablo's paintings and brought them to indigenous tribes in the Amazon and showed them. And these these uh, people were like, "That's ayahuasca. That's that's ayahuasca." And it's like, <laughs> so so Pablo Amaringo he totally nailed it. He he nailed it with the colors, with the subject matter, so much so that people who have done ayahuasca immediately recognize that is the territory. That is ayahuasca. Right. Right. So he well, he he's was become very identified with that too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Of course, because of his story with Terrence and Dennis and Luis Eduardo, yeah, all yeah. together there in uh, South America. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, swigging the brew and mm -hmm. getting to know uh, Pablo Amaringo and encouraging him to become an artist to, to kind of show what yeah. the visions look like. Yeah. yeah. And then, you know, we have other artists like Juan Carlos Tominci. Yes. Uh, who, Amazing. Yeah. Amazing artist who is a, also a shaman from mm -hmm. Peru, um, but is has incorporated a highly developed um, sense of representational reality yes. and the integration of uh, the sort of archetypal and energetic subtle dimensions containing beings and geometries and other kinds of elements that I, I love to point to as well and uh, bringing out the uh, new flavor and also honoring some of the great shaman mm -hmm. uh, in uh, his tradition and uh, so in that way it presents a unique and uh, extension of Pablo's uh, in initiate uh, initiatory jump into uh, ayahuasca art. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and it's amazing to see how these images from these uh, profound artists affect the collective consciousness of, of what that experience is and, and, and what it looks like. Uh, it's just so powerful. You're yeah. really right. And, I, and now I think in a way that, uh, that uh, the Ayahuasca art often represents done by uh, people who have had the medicine or been initiated into uh, this process and are carrying the wisdom of their uh, tribe, in a sense, you know, uh, uh, to the world. Then you've got the, you know, Western visionary artists or visionary artists from all over the world that are also going on journeys, oftentimes with sacrament, meeting up with beings and bringing the the visionary glimpses back into their artwork mm -hmm. and in this way it's relational to the art and shamanism i'm not trying to equate them but i'm trying no. to say that they have a relationship that the artist might journey they might intend to uplift their community with their offerings uh, and that, uh, so in that way, they also feel a tribal likeness, whether they're really, they're not, they're only part of the visionary art tribe, you, you know, which is a vast tribe, you know, but it's, it's not a quote, authentic shamanic, mm. uh, path, mm -hmm. you know? Mm. Well, thank you for exploring art and shamanism with us a little bit. And now perhaps you can give us a little bit of an update on Entheon. Is there anything you'd like to share about that? Well, I saw your floors are coming in, Allison. Yes. They're looking so beautiful. Yes, the floors were uh, a collaboration with uh, Cerebral Concepts and Brian James, who's laying the floor with Jeff Wilson and uh, in my design of the secret writing on the floor going an infinite plane that goes beyond the floor it just seems to go on forever in all directions it's it it's looks very so exciting. gorgeous yeah and your floor in the vestibule will be coming in very soon it's a mandala yeah one of the vision, vision crystal. crystal mandala yeah. made in stone yeah will be inlaid into the vestibule floor and all of these projects were in place and in progress before COVID, and now they're coming to completion. And we had budgeted them, so we're continuing to be able to uh, add one beautiful thing at a time. 
It's amazing. We're grateful to be able to make progress in this uh, troubling time. And uh, stay open. Yeah. Because we're here making videos. And well, we're not open to the public in no. terms of visitors, yeah. but we have the, our kind of Cosm crew that's keeping Cosm uh, going. Mm. We are going, and, and we want to. Yeah. We've been able to kind of open up to a global audience even more so than we ever have through through the internet by going online. And Absolutely, that's, that's been an amazing it's journey. An amazing blessing. Yeah. Well, I feel so grateful to be here at Cosm and to be in surrounded by the beauty of nature, and it feels like the shaman were the ones who were so deeply in touch with this uh, sense of the beauty and sacredness of nature. And I think anyone can recover that sense of the sacredness of nature once they're surrounded by uh, the nature field. And we begin to open up uh, to the intelligence of the web of beings that surround us and are trying to support the healing of the earth. And so it's important that we keep this idea of the shaman and the access to the, a spirit world uh, as a possibility for all of us, you know, and uh, to see in that archetype a, uh, to respect uh, those uh, sacred cultures who have kept alive the specialized knowledge of working with the nature spirits and things and working with the uh, helper beings that surround us. So we're so grateful uh, to examine this subject, you know, and see its relationship to the world of visionary artists uh, who are also in alliance with the spirit world and trying to bring a healing message to the people. And may any merit generated by this gathering for our church be offered to the benefit and liberation of all beings. Mm -hmm.